last time on how to win the loser's game. If you're paying big management fees, that the cumulative effect of that, given the way compounding works, is enormous. Yeah, you know, almost all fund management is a complete rip-off. I mean, we know that. We only have to look at the prices relative to the performance. And the very people who are being prudent and saving and investing are not the ones who are retiring with a comfortable pot. It's the fund managers who are becoming millionaires and billionaires because of those profit margins. Of course, fund management companies could justify high fees and making large profits if they added significant value. Unfortunately, the performance of actively managed funds is consistently very poor. The aim of fund management is to maximise investment returns. Over time, markets deliver returns on their own. They're what we call the market return. We pay managers to deliver more than the market return. In fact, after costs, they rarely do. One well-known expert famously described it as an industry built on witchcraft. We have the most prevalent rule uh, that applies to fund managers everywhere, uh, and that is reversion to the mean. A fund that gets way ahead of the market uh, falls way back behind it. It's witchcraft in the sense that, you know, it's managers hovering over a table thinking they have the answer. You know, I, I, I told people, what is the intellectual basis for indexing? The intellectual base for, basis for indexing, as I've said, is gross return minus cost equals net return, period. What is the intellectual basis for active management? I've never heard one. The closest I've come is a manager says, I can do better. They all say I can do better. 100% of them say I can do better than the market. But 100% don't. Probably about 1% of managers can beat the market over the very long term. That figure of 1%, you may recall, is consistent with the findings of the Pensions Institute report. And that study found that even those 1% of managers actually recover for themselves the value of any outperformance in fees. Several other reports have reached similar conclusions. This is an independent report commissioned by the UK government into the local government pension scheme, one of the biggest public pension schemes in Europe. As you'd expect, some active managers used by the LGPS have outperformed, but the report found there is no evidence that in aggregate the scheme has outperformed regional equity markets. In fact, in many cases, active funds were trounced by passive ones. For example, over 10 years, passive North American equity funds delivered average returns of 2.6% as opposed to 1.7% delivered by active funds. Passive Japanese equity funds also recorded average returns of 2.6% compared to 2.0% for active. What's more, these returns do not take into account the impact of investment charges. The report found that in 2012, asset management costs for the scheme amounted to £790 million, the vast majority of which was paid to active managers. Switching from active to passive investing would save the taxpayer a staggering £660 million a year and deliver similar, if not better, performance. Michael Johnson is a public policy advisor with a specialist interest in pensions. He says the LGPS report is a wake-up call for the whole investment industry. I think it's a seminal moment in uh, the history of investment management or fund management because it really lifts the lid on what is essentially an industry that adds no value to anybody. Essentially, uh, very few people enter that industry with the express purpose of enriching others, and they're very good at what they do, which is enriching themselves. Alan Miller was a successful fund manager, but over the years he became disillusioned with the industry and particularly with the poor performance that managers were delivering year after year. It used to be the institutions had a big advantage they would see the companies first, they would see the management. If they were asked sensible questions, they would get information before other people. This does not happen anymore. There's something called the internet, there's something called information given to everyone, and therefore to have an edge is much harder. It's a bit like companies drilling for oil in the middle of 
nowhere that nobody's drilled before. It doesn't mean they're not going to discover oil, but the vast majority are probably going to just discover fizzy water. The marketing budgets within the big retail companies are millions and millions of pounds. And they've created this image whereby the customer thinks that these big brands are nice and safe, nice and solid, and they, they think they're actually getting something better. They're actually getting something worse. This is the irony in that, basically, if you were to sum it up, less is more. The bigger the institution, the bigger the brand, normally the more you pay, and normally the worse the performance. In a nutshell, you have an industry of fund managers who are trying to outcompete one another in a giant negative sum game. Not a zero sum game, but a negative sum game, because whilst they're doing it, they are extracting charges and fees on an annual basis, which uh, erode the capital of savers. In this competition of trying to outcompete one another, there are bound to be winners and losers every year. And there will be some who claim that on the average they add value, i.e. they win more often than they lose. But if one actually examines the data in detail, as I and others have done, uh, it is nigh impossible to work out who is going to uh, outperform the rest on a consistent basis. And therefore, for, for virtually all investors, making a decision as to which active fund to invest in is a pure lottery. And that's more or less what the Nobel Prize winning economist Eugene Farmer has been saying for more than 50 years. There are lots of studies of persistence in performance. I have one of my students did a very famous thesis on this, Mark Carhart. He ranked the funds based on five years of past returns and kept, did that every year and then examined whether that predicted future performance. Nope, doesn't. Uh, so there's very little persistence in, in performance. But if I take all the funds and look at them over their entire histories, then you're going to see that some of them did extraordinarily well. And books get written about those managers. But in fact, that distribution is pretty consistent with chance. We are several of the largest fund management companies to talk to us about performance, but had no success. But the trade body, the Investment Management Association, did agree to give us its point of view. What evidence do you have that active fund management actually works? Okay, well, over uh, long periods of time, uh, active managers uh, pick stocks that they believe will go up more than the market. But of course, as a group as a whole, we are the market. So that's why you will quite often see reports in the press saying active fund management doesn't outperform the market. Well, the fact is that active kind of is the market, and passive obviously is the market too. So as a group, they can't outperform the market. What people are trying to do is to find managers that do outperform over long periods of time. And in fact, most people are quite successful at doing that because what you'll find is that the managers that demonstrate an ability to outperform the market reasonably consistently have the bigger funds, and ones that don't contract quite rapidly. So the lion's share of new money and switching money goes into the funds of people who do outperform. But Michael Johnson is unimpressed. That's mathematical nonsense. How can you have, if he's suggesting that the majority of money is successful, how can the majority be outperforming the minority? Doesn't make sense. This is an industry that is a genius at obfuscation and bamboozlement with terminology that is utterly meaningless and it needs to be challenged. So what are the implications of all this for investors? Well, ultimately we need active fund managers to set prices to ensure that we all receive fair value for money. But that doesn't mean that every investor should pay for their services. Indeed, the high cost of active management, combined with its dismal track record and the near impossibility of identifying the next star performer should make the average investor extremely wary. But before we investigate alternative approaches, we're going to find out what the academic evidence says about investing and the best way to go about it. Next time on how to win the loser's game. The expectation of the speculator is zero because when you buy something, uh, you expect that the price is going to rise. But if you buy something 
someone else has to sell it and this other person think the price is going to go down. When you think about green pharma and efficient markets, uh, don't think about Einstein and some big theory that nobody can understand. A gene's theoretical framework is quite easy to understand. Uh, competition means that prices reflect information.